it. Once again, welcome to the Stewardship Network's monthly webcast. So a little bit about us to kick things off. The Stewardship Network is a 501c3 nonprofit organization with an award-winning 20-year history. We are now serving 20-plus place-based TSN member communities from the Great Lakes to the Pacific Ocean. And our free TSN webcasts happen on the second Wednesday of each month in the Eastern Time Zone's noon hour. Our mission is to connect, equip, and mobilize people and organizations to care for land and water in their communities. So we mobilize folks through our TSN member communities. We make collaborative ecological stewardship accessible to all. We equip, we remove hurdles for TSN member communities so they can pour thousands of annual work hours into their ecosystems. And we connect the specialized knowledge we've collected from and for TSN member communities, and we share it as widely as possible. So one great example of connect is our Stewardship Network Conference, of course. Um, we are really excited to have you all at the conference this year, January 29th, or sorry, next year, January 29th and 30th. Um, so please do sign up. And uh, if you register now, you can enjoy a little bit of a discount. Uh, so please do uh, register at stewardshipnetwork.org slash conference. We'd also like to highlight the Stewardship Network's Gloves for Good program. We've had some really amazing uh, updates lately that we would like to share with you. So we have distributed over 21,000 pairs of gloves since the program started. Uh, reminder that the program is uh, involves receiving uh, lightly used gloves from an industrial partner of ours, and we wash those and pair them with the help of several different partner organizations. And then we distribute those to uh, folks that would like to use them for stewardship free of charge. The only thing we ask for is that you pay for shipping if that is necessary. Otherwise, you can choose localized pickup at our Ann Arbor office. Um, so really, really excited to uh, get over that milestone of 21,000, over 21,000 pairs of gloves distributed. That is over 1,500 pounds of waste diverted from landfills. So not only are these gloves being utilized for a great purpose, we're also reducing the amount of waste that is being uh, sent to landfills. And that equates to over $32,000 saved for our partners that choose to use these gloves. Uh, you know, we know that gloves, you know, buying them in the bulk, buying them in bulk is relatively cheap, but this is an even cheaper option and one that you can feel really good about by utilizing gloves that otherwise would make it to the landfill. And we are so very excited to be a part of this or to help facilitate this program. And we invite you to request your own pair of gloves at stewardshipnetwork.org slash gloves. Uh, send us an inquiry and we'd be happy to work with you. As you can see uh, on the right hand side of your screen over here, that is one of our latest Latest orders that is remarkably big. I would venture to say taller than me, actually. That uh, and I, I want to shout out Bob and Lizzie and all the rest of our team that was involved in getting those gloves packed up and shipped out the door. We are so excited to be able to provide this service for our partners. And of course, I can't mention all of these great things that we do: the monthly webcast, the conference, the Gloves for Good program all of the things that we do for our TSN member communities without mentioning our Meet the Match campaign. So our end of year campaign this year, we have a generous donor that is matching all of our donations one-to-one -one, up to $250,000. But here's the kicker. We need to hit that $250,000 in order to get the match. And so it's an all or nothing. And we're pulling out all the stops, asking all of our partners to dig deep, and do what you can to support the Stewardship Network. We are so, so appreciative of everybody that has already donated. And we are really appreciative of everyone that helps us spread the word about this important initiative for our organization. As you can see, we're well on our way and we've got just a few weeks left to go, but we are really, really excited. And we are hoping that you all can help us and support us in this mission and in trying to meet that match. So let's do it. And thank you again so much to everybody that has supported us. And I encourage you to learn more about the Stewardship Network and to make your contribution. Whatever you can contribute, we are very, very appreciative for you. And with that, I will get into uh, the webcast for this month. So our guest this month is Abigail J. Lynch, a research fish biologist with the USGS National Climate Adaptation Science Center. And today she will be talking about radical ecosystem change, applying the RAD resistance accept direct framework. And with that, Abigail, I would love to give it over to you. Great. Um, 
let's see. Uh, I guess I stopped your screen sharing. Yep, you can go ahead and do that. Okay, just to confirm that everything's showing. It looks great right to me. Front. Okay, great. Absolutely. Um, well, thank you all for having me. Um, again, my name is Abigail Lynch, and I'm with the U.S. Geological Survey based at the National Climate Adaptation Science Center. And today I'm going to be talking to you about the, the RAD network or RAD framework or the Resist Accept Direct framework and um, how that fits into managing for ecosystem change. Uh, and just uh, as a as a an opening uh, plug, I guess, for, for those that aren't familiar with the program that I work for, um, the Climate Adaptation Science Centers are um, based at USGS and the mission of our program is to deliver science to help fish, wildlife, water, land, and people, of course, <laughs> adapt to changing climates. And uh, the focus of our program is really on impacts and adaptation. Um, and we have a number of different areas that, that we work in, but essentially uh, most of our work um, amounts to helping managers protect public lands and natural resources. Um, we do a lot of work collaborating with tribes and indigenous communities and other vulnerable communities to prepare for climate risks. Um, and then we have a large component of our program that is focused on education and training for the next generation of, of scientists. And um, just quickly to, to show you where our, our footprint is across the country, um, there are nine regional adaptation science center, climate adaptation science centers, um, and one national center. And these are all federal and university partnerships with um, a federal um, administrator and then a university lead. And they're often, as you can see, um, based on, on the different uh, universities involved, they're consortium based. So there are a number of different um, universities that are involved in the program. And, and I'm based at the National Climate Adaptation Science Center, which is uh, just outside of Washington, DC and Virginia. Um, so with that, um, back to this picture of the beach and um, over the course of, of this short presentation, um, I hope, hope to convey a couple basic points. Um, so first, I'm gonna start uh, with the premise that, that ecosystems are changing and they're changing in unprecedented ways. And if we continue to do, or continue to use the same approaches that we, we have historically used, then we'll be likely to, or we'll likely be unsuccessful in um, designating effective management strategies to meet new challenges because of this unprecedented change. Um, second, I'm going to introduce this RAD or Resist Accept Direct framework um, as a useful tool to navigate this unfamiliar, ter unfamiliar territory of uh, systems change. And then lastly, um, I wanted to end with framing how to make this uh, practicable. Um, you know, RAD is unfortunately not a silver bullet um, and, and RAD decisions are never final. So um, these pathways and strategies need to be reevaluated as, as systems continue to change. And so I'm gonna end with talking a bit about that. Um, so to, to start on the, on the first side uh, with the premise that ecosystems are changing, um, I wanted to provide uh, a short personal vignette or example. And so um, this is a, a photo of my family um, at Hunting Island State Park, um, which is in South Carolina. I'm not sure how um, familiar most folks are with that area, um, but it's it's a less than a, a two hour drive from Charleston, South Carolina, if folks are familiar with that. Um, and it's the most popular state park in South Carolina. Um, so they have somewhere over a million visitors um, each year. And so even though I mostly work on inland fisheries and, and inland fish, and I'm, I'm from Virginia, and I actually have ties to the Midwest too. Um, I went to Michigan State for my, my PhD. Um, I, and I'm not from South Carolina. I do, I have family that live in this area. And so um, when I think of systems change or ecosystem change, um, this image of Hunting Island often comes to mind. Um, and I think for me and, and probably many others, um, because climate change is often very intangible um, and operating on long time scales, it, it's hard to always 
see climate change in, in that respect. And so um, there are a few systems like these kind of coastal systems that are experiencing sea level rise where these long-term impacts of, of climate, um, you know, it's a very slow process, but but they are clearly very recognizable on, on the span of a, a human understanding. And so um, especially when there's um, fast events like hurricanes that, that are involved in the system. And so, um, you know, these fast events, um, as you'll see as I, I transition slides, are becoming in increasingly frequent in this area. And so they, they kind of compound the effects of the slower ongoing um, sea level rise. So uh, very quickly, I just wanted to give you um, a very short personal timeline of, of Hunting Island as, as an example to tee off the rest of the talk. So um, this is a photo of, of my dog, Ben, who is actually sleeping right next to me and hopefully he won't um, interrupt during during this uh, webinar. But um, this is a photo of him from 2014. And, um, you know, really, the uh, well, I, of course, I like showing pictures of my dog. The, the main point um, that I wanted to show here is to, to focus your attention on um, the, the, the landscape behind Ben. And so um, Hunting Island in 2014 was very forested. There were pine trees, palmetto palms, um, even live oaks, which are, are a special kind of um, tree in that low country area. Um, they were right up to the beach. And so um, when you would drive out to the park, um, you felt almost as if you were driving through a jungle. Um, and in fact, as a kind of fun side movie trivia, um, Hunting Island was a stand-in for all of the Vietnam scenes in Forrest Gump. Um, and actually, uh, another kind of a movie trivia, all, all of Forrest Gump was, was filmed in and around this area of South Carolina in Beaufort. Um, but the thinking of back to those four, the scenes from Vietnam, those took place on Hunting Island. And so it basically looked like a jungle. Um, so uh, then in 2016, Hurricane Matthew hit Hunting Island and Beaufort and the Charleston area pretty, pretty dead on. Um, and so uh, at, because of because people in that area were not allowed back onto these islands and, and into the park for quite some time, um, there were a lot of big trees that came down. And, and cleanup efforts were, were very long term. And so the state park at Hunting Island um, was closed for a long time because it had so many downed trees and there was debris in all of the recreational area. Um, so the park kind of began to reopen in stages um, and my family was able to come back in, in the summer of 2017. Um, and again, <laughs> The, the focus of, or why I'm showing this photo is I want you to take a look at, at behind me and, and my son. Um, and you can see that the, the canopy is already noticeably much thinner than it was in the picture with Ben in 2014. Um, and at this time, you know, the infrastructure in the park was very limited um, and they were just getting everything back online and about a year after the, the hurricane had hit. But um, then again, another storm hit in 2017. And so this was um, Hurricane Irma. Um, and so this storm was not the same strength as the previous storm, Matthew, uh, but, but because of the timing of when the storm hit, the water levels were actually higher. And so it was enough to generate a 15 to 20 foot storm surge on Hunting Island. Um, so it flooded out basically all of the electrical systems uh, that had just been repaired and replaced uh, in the park. And so um, all of this kind of came as, as a big surprise to communities in this area because this portion of the South Carolina coast is usually quite protected um, from storms just based on the, the coastline shape. And so, um, you know, it's not generally considered a pr pretty vulnerable spot, uh, something like compared to the Outer Banks in, in North Carolina. Uh, but having these two storms really back to back um, were, were quite substantial in terms of impacts to the region. And so by the time my family got back out to Hunting Island again, it was uh, the end of 2018 um, and the park had fully reopened, but there were still a bunch of down trees like the guys here are standing on um, and many of the roads were still quite impassable. Um, and then fast forward a, a few more years, this is a photo from 
August um, 2020, and they had done a lot of work by this point. So um, perhaps most substantially, they had a massive beach nourishment program to build up dunes and, and even did some um, grass plantings to, to help kind of stabilize those dunes. And so at this point, the beach looks substantially different than it did um, back in that 2014 photo with Ben. Um, so most of the live trees that are left are palms. Um, and, you know, the, so most of the, the oaks and the pines have, have um, succumbed to either uh, the storm damage or um, saltwater indonation into the, the areas where they were, were growing. And so it definitely does not look like it did be, before. And all of this is, all of these changes are an attempt to armor the, the area against climate change. And so, and then this is one last uh, photo from, from, I guess it was last Christmas. Um, and again, looking to the, the background of the slide, not my, my sons and my nephew in the front, um, now that the beach has has grown, so it's it's pretty wide, um, and some of the beach grass plantings are are filling in, um, and you know the forested area is still experiencing dr dramatic change. So um, you can see a number of those trees in the background are now um, completely dead, and um, some of them are still standing, but but th but they're no longer alive, and so. Uh, a lot of the trees are continuing to to die as a result of the the saltwater indonation, and so um, th these are often called ghost forests, just because they're they're still standing, but but the trees are no longer alive. And so, um, you know, since I've been visiting, those ghost forests have really rapidly expanded in this in this part of of the country. So, um, just like very quickly to run through, so in this relatively short span of time, we've seen really dramatic, fast, and slow changes that are occurring across this landscape, and also management interventions that are have been put in place to address these changes. And I just present this little vignette to tee up the, the remainder of my of talk in that um, this is an example for me, but obviously ecosystem transformations are happening across many diverse landscapes. So just to run through a few quick examples. Um, for example, in the Arctic, um, obviously we're having lots of uh, retreating of sea, sea ice. And this is a major problem for walruses because um, they have to go further up onto beaches and there's a, an increased risk of stampede mortality, particularly for the pups. Um, another example, this is a photo um, from South Africa and ha uh, a picture of where um, kind of showing that altitudinal limit of savannas. And, and as um, climate is changing, that altitudinal limit uh, um, is changing. And so grasslands are, are spreading in, in a way that they haven't been present in that landscape before. Um, another pretty uh, visually stark example is, is in the tropical oceans. So, um, you know, with raising, raising ocean temperatures and ocean acidification, there's many instances of, of, of mass coral bleaching events that are occurring around the world. Um, and this example is, is from the base of the Cedar Mountains in the Great Basin. Um, and this is showing, comparing between historical and, and more recent, um, basically this area has been grass, there's been a grassification event um, that, is, that has occurred. And, in addition to, to that changing kind of climate, um, there's been a, the addition of an invasive um, cheatgrass, which makes the system much more prone to fire. So that's a, a large um, change to that ecosystem. And then one last example, um, and perhaps maybe the most visually stark example, is, is how much glaciers have been retreating. So this is um, as a result of, of temperature increases and um, loss of snowpack. So this is from a, a photo from Glacier National Park. Um, and then this is the, the more recent version of it. And, and this is, um, there, there have been actually in recent years within Glacier National Park, um, this has led to Endangered Species Act, Act listings for um, the small aquatic species that are, are reliant upon that glacial melt. Um, so for example, the, there's a a small stone meltwater stone fly 
um, that relies on that glacial melt for portions of their life cycle, and they've been recently listed as endangered. So, um, so kind of transitioning, um, when we think about these ecosystem changes um, as an ecological concept, ecosystem change isn't isn't new. Um, but the current causes of these ecosystem transformations are really unprecedented. You know, historically, main drivers of change are natural climate variability, um, following kind of traditional or uh, following um, glacial and interglacial timescales. But now uh, most of global change is anthropogenically derived. So we have climate change, land use change, invasive disease habitat fragmentation, you know, all of these are additive effects. And so um, these transformations are occurring really at unprecedented rates and at unprecedented spatial scales. But, um, you know, at least in the near term, um, these kind of extreme, if, if the extreme transformations aren't necessarily happening in your system, it can often be easier to not want to think about those kind of longer term trajectories. And so, um, but I want to emphasize that that delayed action can really increase the risk of irreversible changes in ecosystem structure, function, and composition, and it can result in lost opportunities to adapt to these changing systems. And so um, this kind of paralysis can equate to higher um, cumulative economic costs, greater losses of ecosystem services, and and really more substantial consequences to the natural systems. But, um, you know, as, as a broader community, a stewardship community, we often lack a common lexicon for having these uncomfortable conversations about what comes next, um, you know, and we cannot maintain ecosystems or restore or rehabilitate them to what they once were. Um, and we have to think about what to consider in terms of other options. And so this is where um, the RAD framework comes in. So we've introduced this resist, accept, direct framework to really help initiate conversations about what comes next for these transforming systems. Um, and to me, the, the real value of RAD um, is that it just lays out options um, and it encompasses really the entire decision space and it helps individuals and, and groups and, and teams work together and, and actually being deliberate in thinking about how each of these options represents trade-offs um, among management goals and societal values and, and available resources. And so um, I think the real value here of RAD is that it creates a, a more common language for having these uncomfortable conversations about what comes next. And um, you know when we can really no longer restore or rehabilitate systems and we really have to, consider um, thinking about accepting or directing change um, in addition to just trying to resist it. So, and then also I think it doesn't hurt that it's got a pretty cool acronym. So um, just to, to go into each of the sections of the, of the framework uh, briefly, um, first is, is resist. And so um, with this, this is um, to, the aim of this is to really maintain the current or return to historical conditions. And um, often resist is, is really the, the option that, that most folks are comfortable with because this is um, you know, most closely aligned with precautionary principles of management um, and, and aligned with things like restoration and rehabilitation and conservation in general. Um, and so basically any sort of um, restoration or rehabilitation effort to slow the progress of ecosystem transformations falls into this category. And so this is just an example of um, riparian tree plantings. Um, so second uh, is, is if you accept the trajectory of, of your transforming system and you allow the change to occur fairly autonomously. And so um, and, and thinking about things in terms of the, the broader landscape, acceptance is, is often um, likely to be the most common choice for managers, because if you have limited resources, um, you're not going to be able to afford to intervene um, in every instance. And so, um, so often there are things where we have to decide to, to accept 
that this one is going to change, this system is going to change on its own. Uh, but I still think it's worth reemphasizing that this is, this is, uh, this can be a very deliberate choice and, and not necessarily a default decision. So um, something that would fall in this category um, would be something like announce, announcing fishing restrictions due to low water levels or high temperatures. Um, and this photo, I think, is um, from a, an article uh, in a maybe Montana um, newspaper a couple of years ago where um, the, the article was discussing how they had um, the, the earliest fishing restrictions um, in the past 30 years because they had low water levels and high temperatures and it, it drastically changed um, the, the timing of when they could fish and, and as a result, the associated recreational industries. Um, and then lastly, um, direct, uh, this is where um, managers are actively stewarding a system towards a preferred new state. Um, and this is often, but, but, but maybe not always, um, an option that gets the broad pushback in terms of implementation, uh, just because people, myself included, inherently don't like change. And it, it kind of flies in the face of precautionary approaches to management. Um, and it, it's just something that folks are often not comfortable kind of um, taking that action to um, initiate a new trajectory or a new course. But it is um, starting to be used in, in different instances. Um, and this is a photo of some work that was done uh, by USGS folks in the, the Rocky Mountain West, where they actually translocated endangered bull trout um, from their current habitat to a new location that, that they had never been, um, that it was beyond their natural range, but it was like a higher elevation location that would have more suitable habitat for the fish. So it is starting to be used across the landscape. And, and I'll also mention that um, the Endangered Species Act that now has a new kind of designation, I think it's um, section something J, uh, now I'm blanking on the number, but um, basically the, with the idea of having um, experimental populations that are of, of endangered species that are allowed to be moved to um, entirely new habitats. So, so there are even um, kind of policy level frameworks that, that are allowing for these sorts of approaches to be implemented. Um, so, uh, but you know, this, the concept of RAD is, is, is not really that radical in that like the options are, um, a, a many of them in terms of strategies really map quite nicely upon um, existing natural resource conservation and management actions. Um, it's mostly just reframing how the, how how we think about them. And so, um, again, because I'm a, a fish person, I'm going to give a few aquatic examples here. But um, so resist options would be things like stocking or removing invasive species or um, like the, the first example I showed about improving um, riparian shading or um, just having put and take fisheries when um, a location can no longer sustain um, their sustain populations uh, naturally. Except would be something like if you had a stocking program, uh, but the uh, fish are no longer able to survive in, in that climate, uh, stopping such programs. Um, you can adjust harvest levels, like in that example I provided of the Montana fisheries, um, or even close fisheries during certain times uh, based on temperatures and, and water levels. Um, and, um, or, you know, in some cases, you can even consider options like um, having aquaculture replace wild fisheries. And then examples of of uh, direct could be like that bull trout um, example that I just uh, mentioned where um, you're translocating impacted species and, and doing conservation introductions um, or, you know, at another extreme, you could introduce aquaculture of different species that are more um, amenable, the habitat is more suitable for. So, um, and then, so I think one, one point it, that's important to note is that none of these options are mutually exclusive, so they can be implemented simultaneously 
um, on uh, across a landscape with different components across different aspects. Um, and I think one really good example of this is, is work that's been done in Minnesota where they've designated certain lakes as Cisco refuge lakes um, because those lakes uh, are likely to be um, suitable habitat for Cisco um, in, in a reasonable length of time. Um, and then they're recognizing that not all of their lakes will be suitable for Cisco and they're essentially accepting that those systems are changing um, and managing them for different um, management effects. And so, um, yeah, they're basically just letting them go for other priorities. So um, if you remember anything about RAD, uh, I, I hope to, to emphasize five points. So the, the first being that um, RAD was really developed and helps manage directional change. So in most cases, um, the, the usage is around climate change, but but it can actually apply to a, a number of other things. Um, RAD has been applied to invasive species work. Um, actually, some folks applied it to um, responses to COVID in terms of uh, small scale fisheries in Hawaii. So it's, it's a, a framework that can be broadly applicable, but the key kind of driver of it is that, that is it is in response to directional change from some sort of stimulus. Second, um, RAD encompasses the full decision space. And so it opens up, the, the value of it is that it opens up the range of options beyond what is usually considered. And so it's helping people think about other options that could be on the table. But um, I want to emphasize that that RAD is not prescriptive, so it, it, it lays out these options, but it doesn't tell you which you should do. It only tells you what you could do. So it basically is giving you a menu of options, but you have to use other kind of decision tools and approaches um, to really decide which is the most appropriate in your given situation. Um, and then as I mentioned, just with the, the Cisco example, um, RAD options are not mutually exclusive. So they can either be applied sequentially for um, a certain management responsibility, or they can be um, applied concurrently using something more akin to like a portfolio approach. And then lastly, um, you know, while some outcomes are irreversible, um, I want to emphasize that no RAD decision is ever final because um, the systems are continuing to change. We'll need to continue to revisit those decisions as the systems continue to change. So this often uh, begs the question, kind of building from that final point, is um, you know trying to drill down to if you have a current management pathway, uh, when when is that no longer viable? So basically, you can do this RAD option until when. Um, this is a common question that that we get in presenting RAD. I think that the RAD um, kind of options are fairly intuitive, but how to implement it is is often the difficult hurdle. And so, you know, as these systems continue to change, we recognize that these RAD decisions will need to be reevaluated, and one may no longer be appropriate or feasible as the system continues to change. Um, and so, you know, the question is then, um, at what point do you really revisit those management pathways? And this figure on, um, on the right is, is an example of how um, RAD really can fit within an adaptive, adaptive management context, but there's a stage at which you still have to reevaluate if you're on uh, an appropriate management uh, trajectory. But, um, and, and I want to reemphasize this point from earlier, um, you know, if we wait so long to decide that we don't want to resist, because that's generally the um, initial context that we start from, and especially in terms of management of, of important uh, resources or systems. Um, but if we wait too long, um, there we may have already missed opportunities to prepare for adapting to ecosystem change under any, any RAD strategy. Um, and, and kind of holding on to this resist uh, for longer than we should likely comes with higher economic costs, 
greater losses of ecosystem services and, and more substantial consequences to the systems. Um, and so another way to, to ask this uh, question of when is, is um, when are um, RAD strategies no longer feasible? And so we see uh, in, in kind of RAD groups and discussions, uh, we often see this as, as three kind of levels of, of feasibility. And so the first being um, ecologically. So basically, if the system state exceeds the range of contemporary variability, it's probably not going to be ecologically sustainable to maintain the same management strategies. Secondly, um, if the financial costs of, of doing certain management actions are beyond what funds are allowable to it, um, you know, that strategy will no longer be feasible in its current form. And then lastly, you know, if a, a community no longer is willing to prioritize a current strategy, um, then that's another very valid reason for, for changing course. So. Um, and let me do one more slide. So, um, so when we think about what, what, taking this rad until when um, kind of decision point, um, we're, we're starting, and this is like a very active area of thought within the rad community at this point. So I'd be curious for folks for feedback from everyone on, on if it resonates or if, if it's still confusing, but um, basically, uh, we're trying to identify um, a decision prompt uh, for if you have a systems indicator that when you meet it, you know it's time to kind of reevaluate your thinking about that pathway. Um, and, you know, these prompts may, may or may not lead to a change in your management strategy, but it's just like a point to make sure you kind of step back and see um, that this system may be changing to the point where you may need to reprioritize your actions. And ideally, um, this would happen before you reach a, a threshold or a tipping point. Um, but, you know, with, with systems lags and um, kind of other uncertainties surrounding this unprecedented level of change, this really isn't always possible. Um, and so, yeah, so systems lags can really have um, significant consequences on the outcomes and it's it's difficult to factor those into decisions. And so as a result, um, often you have to be more responsive uh, as, a re as opposed to anticipatory because it's difficult to um, consider and predict when, when those will occur. Um, but there are some ways to help reduce some of that uncertainty. And so, um, both experiments and monitoring can really help identify um, those like indicators that that can really um, trigger or uh, prompt reevaluation. And so, um, experiments can fall in the category of things like conducting studies um, to identify what would be a, tr a tipping point or a threshold, um, and then monitoring can be you know you're tracking specific systems indicators for early detection of what those ecological tipping points are or systems thresholds. Um, and not only ecological, I think they could be also financial or social as well. And so all of this really amounts to um, taking things uh, as, as informed risk taking. Um, you know, when you, we're planning in the face of uncertainty, which is inherently risky, uh, but these decisions will need to be made regardless. Um, so the idea is to try to help make more informed choices and rather than completely uninformed ones. Um, and so like in this photo, you know, if you're going to go swimming, would you rather know if you, you saw a shark or um, if there hadn't been sharks there? Seems like, you know, still some uncertainty, but it, but it could help make your decision a little easier. Um, and so just to kind of wrap up, I want to re-emphasize those those five points about the the rad framework again um, because I think they're they're really critical to like thinking about rad and understanding it. Um, uh, first, being that rad is really set up to um, address or manage a, a system that is facing directional change. The second is that 
RAD encompasses essentially the full decision space and the, the value of this or what it adds often to, to these kind of discussions and conversations is that it opens to options that are beyond the range that are historically or usually considered. Um, but, you know, when thinking about those options, RAD is not prescriptive. And so it provides a, a menu of adaptation options, but it won't tell you, and it'll only tell you what you can do um, it, or could do. It doesn't tell you what you should do. And so you have to kind of pair up RAD with, with other um, management tools, like, for example, structured decision making or adaptive management or um, climate smart conservation, things like that, where um, it can help kind of add on to these existing processes to help make those decisions. Um, and, you know, as you're making those decisions, uh, it's important to note that RAD options are not mutually exclusive. So you can either um, apply them to one decision sequentially and, and change your approaches sequentially, or you can think of things um, from like a broader landscape where you're taking kind of a a uh, diversified portfolio approach where you, you're trying to do some things in some areas and and other approaches in the other and, and hope that in the end you still end up with it with a, a reasonable result that links to your management objectives. And then lastly, um, you know, it, and this is often the hardest thing to, to think on, but, you know, there are outcomes in terms of shifting climates um, species extinctions, for example, that are, are completely irreversible. Um, you can't go back to what it was before. But um, I think it, it, there's often difficulties or, or people sometimes um, have a little bit of a hiccup with RAD in thinking that once you make a RAD decision, you're done with the process. But because RAD um, is in relation to systems that are, are facing directional change, the systems will continue to change um, and so those decisions need to be revisited. And so with that, I just want to thank everyone um, for, for attending. And I hope uh, this was somewhat informative. And um, if, if you have questions, happy to, to take those now. Um, otherwise, my email is, is on, the, on the screen. And also, um, I wanted to draw your attention to this. We have a USGS website that's specifically focused on RAD. And there's a number of RAD-related uh, publications and products that might be of interest. Excellent. Thank you so very much, Abigail. That was amazing. Um, lots to chew on there. We've got a couple questions coming in. So I want to encourage folks once again to share your questions in the chat or sorry, not in the chat in the Q&A um, function if you'd like and any comments or resources or the things like that can go into the chat. Um, so I was really intrigued by one of the things that you were talking about. So it was the, the prompts in terms of um, changing the management strategy. And I, I'm curious if you could talk more about where uh, you're at with that or what you've heard in terms of feedback when you do these presentations. My immediate yeah. thought is, um, could there be a process of identifying, it's kind of what you described, but uh, a process of identifying these major factors within a system yeah. and then establishing certain criteria for when they have reached the point of reevaluation, even if that yes. doesn't mean changing of direction, but it's like, how do I, how do I look at this ecosystem and say, this is made up of these things primarily for these reasons. And, you know, so I was just curious if you could talk a little bit more, because there was some interest in there about the prompt kind of system and how, uh, how to define the point at which it's time to reevaluate. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I will say we have, um, there's a, a small community of us that are like actively, have, we have biweekly calls talking about this exact concept. And um, right now we're trying to develop a, a set of, or basically a short list of best practices for trying to do exactly what you're saying, Rob, in terms of um, for your system, be it like an ecological reason, like if your ecological feasibility is, is, is going to be um, no longer possible, social or financial, um, like what would be a set of key questions that you could ask about your system to basically flag, oh, this is the type of indicator that we should be potentially monitoring to know that if we reach this criteria or this threshold or level, 
um, maybe threshold isn't the right thing because we, we may not know if it is uh, like an ecological threshold, but if we reach a predefined um, level, then we really should reevaluate if this is the appropriate strategy. And so obviously everything is context dependent on the different systems, but we're trying to identify a short list of the types of questions that you might want to ask to start to frame up a, a management plan for potentially or like identifying when you need to reevaluate your strategies. So, so yeah, but it's very active. We're still in the, in like in the midst of that right now, but it's often been um, a question when, when I've presented or others in the, the red community have presented is that, yeah, we understand that this, but like, wh when do we know to change and when do we know to switch tactics? And, and that's a tough question. Yeah. And as you said, it's not, uh, you know, prescriptive. It's, it's very much a, a way to try to understand uh, the situation. And that makes me think of, so in describing uh, how the RAD framework could be applied, you kind of gave these two very broad uh, kind of examples of how, and one of them you were talking about sequential. So like there might be yeah. with, for the same certain factor, and then the other being a more kind of like diversified approach. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about it. And so this is a question or a suggestion, and just tell me if I'm on the right track here, and maybe it's helpful for some other folks too thinking about, so for example, I'm helping to manage and monitor an ecosystem. I know that I will not be able to change the average annual temperature of that system. So that might be an accept type thing, but mm -hmm. then there might be changes in water flow in that area that I could have some form of impact on. So maybe I'm doing more of a direct or something mm -hmm. of the, you know, or a resist. So is that kind of how you're thinking about it is like exactly. different factors. Okay. Different factors. Within yeah. So different factors. Um, it could also be in, in a, a way, um, I guess, thinking to the Cisco refuge lakes example, um, where you may have like a mosaic approach across the landscape that you're managing. So where you will, um, for example, work to conserve, habitat in this Cisco refuge lake, but the other lakes that are kind of nearby in the system, which aren't likely to be suitable habitat in the next 50 years, we're, we're gonna manage those for other um, recreational or, or other species priorities. So, um, and actually that reminds me that we have another, um, it, it's a really nice tool that we've worked on with Wisconsin DNR um, in terms of stocking strategies for walleye that they've um, basically have, they have um, the ability to identify different lake classes within Wisconsin. Um, and they know kind of which systems are, have self-sustaining populations of walleye. They know which systems um, can support walleye, but they, they don't, they're not reproducing populations. So if you stock, they'll survive and, and can be a, a reasonable fishery there. And then they're looking ahead to projections and climate on kind of which systems will no longer, you know, in the near future, they won't even be able to support stocking um, and, and put and take type fisheries. And so they've used this tool to identify which lakes that they will invest in stocking, which lakes they're not going to bother to invest in stocking. So, so that's kind of a, a different a mosaic approach, but uh, bo both, um, both types of, of um, concurrent strategies can, can be applied. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so then there's a question in the chat as well, um, wondering about uh, what you talk about a little bit, your colleagues and how you've been discussing it. So has this concept entered kind of the realm of academia or like what is the kind of, you know, general um, sentiment or or I guess even adoption of this framework looking yeah. like in the, in the landscape right now? Yeah, that's, that's a great um, question. And I would say, it, you know, we're, uh, trying to normalize the concept in, in a, a, a number of different arenas, but the kind of earlier, the I guess the earlier thought leaders in, in this whole kind of development of the framework have come mostly from um, the Department of Interior. So there were books from the, the National Park Service, USGS, the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, BLM. Uh, it started um, with a group of folks in the federal system and then it also started with a group of folks that were affiliated with the American Fishery Society and the Wildlife Society, um, looking at, so both of those societies at one 
point, uh, I guess it's probably you know, maybe five years ago or something, identified ecosystem transformation as an important um, topic that they wanted to explore in the field of fisheries, in the field of, of, of wildlife management. And so um, we essentially um, brought together a group of experts that were interested in the topic. And so we've collaborated on, on thinking on RAD and then this other um, federal group. So they, they, they're called FedNet. It was like uh, federal navigation or federal ecosystem transformation or navigating federal or navigating ecosystem transformation on federal lands. Um, so, so those groups kind of coalesced together and kind of formed the broader community of practice around RAD. Um, and I would say in terms, so th there's been some academic publications and there's academics that are working on it as well. Um, and then there's been local implementation um, in a number of different states. So Wisconsin and, and Minnesota are both thinking about using RAD and, and how they're framing certain management strategies. Um, and then there's a number of different national parks that are that are kind of implementing RAD in their climate adaptation processes. Um, and then broadly within the Department of Interior, um, they've just kind of um, initiated a large scale uh, effort or well, they, they have like a manual chapter in the Department of Interior that's looking at climate adaptation and RAD is, is feeding into that process too. So right. it's still nascent, but but mm -hmm. expanding. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and and uh, you know something that's interesting to think about in terms of so they're I'm thinking about scope, right? So if you think about something like accept of mm -hmm. uh, 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 someone who's managing an ecosystem and accepting something like climate change, that's accepting within the scope of what that ecologist is managing in that current moment. But thinking about the larger implications and the larger integrations of initiatives, right? So folks that are working on climate resilience within mm -hmm. infrastructure or, you know, uh, sustainable energy or things like that, you yeah. know, these wider issues that will inherently have an impact on these on the ground systems. But if I'm understanding correctly, uh, you know, you, you have to at a certain point define your scope in order to apply yeah. this RAD framework, because otherwise it will just become so like, what, what can you uh, impact and what you cannot? And so I don't know, just, yeah. just, is, is there anything more you'd like to speak to that tension or does that sound accurate in terms of? Yeah, no, I, I, that very much resonates um, with my understanding too. And I mean, I think a lot of um, difficulties or frustrations or challenges or opportunities, I'm not quite sure what the right word is, but when you think about um, natural resource management and conservation and uh, restoration and rehabilitation, you know, often, uh, our community has uh, only control over so many elements that, that are affecting the systems. And so um, I think RAD has resonated with managers because it's more action oriented than some, some other kind of framings related to options for climate change and that it, it, it gives, um, <laughs> it gives some agency to managers to, address it within the scope of their realm of management, you know? And so, um, yeah, there, there are things that are not in our capacity to change as a, as a, a fisheries manager, like how, how much the temperatures are going to rise, but we do have the capacity to think ahead and um, have an understanding of, okay, this is not likely to be suitable habitat. Are we investing wisely to put resources into um, stocking the system when the fish aren't going to survive. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we may have time for just one more, but I'm, I'm combining a couple questions into one here because it's a theme that I'm recognizing okay. and it gets a little bit to that direction that we just moved from kind of the high level and the scoping and how do you define kind of like, you know, what is within our control? So the question came up, with regards to uh, using the direct approach, because mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned it, it's kind of small experiments or, or is one way that that can happen because yeah. uh, one of the folks in the chat brought up the um, reluctance that managers might have about proposing solutions that may end up having unintended negative consequences. Yeah. And so, and, and that's, that, that's something that I'm seeing uh, as a theme. So I guess I was just curious, do you, 
Do you have recommendations or is that something that you all have, uh, you know, dove deeper into about what is what is the proper scope of something like a direct and how do you manage the unintended consequences that may happen through something like small experiments? Yeah, uh, no, it's uh, I think that's a major challenge and especially just in terms of framing and uh, responsibility of, of people. I mean, it, it's very difficult to, to kind of take responsibility for an action that may have an unintended consequence. And um, so it, it's it's a major challenge for people to, to try to implement these kind of direct approaches on the ground. And, um, you know, I, I think I've been a part of a number of conversations and, and a workshop um, in particularly focused on RAD with the Fish and Wildlife Service. And um, that that comment was coming up constantly where, you know, the the on the ground refuge manager um, is willing to potentially try a different strategy, but they but they're concerned that if, you know, it ends up having an unintended consequence, like, uh, are they going to be supported by their upper levels of management? And so um, it really does have to, it, it has to be a combination of of top down and bottom up in that, um, you know, an organization has to be uh, recognized that there are some risks with any of these actions um, and be willing to to accept some of some level of risk. And, um, you know, the and the response point, I think, for me, because obviously the the direct ones are kind of a realm of complete uncertainty. Um, but even if you're you're taking an accept decision or a resist accept their decision, because the systems are changing in unprecedented ways, there's also likely to be unexpected changes. Um, even if you go with one of those maybe less controversial options too, so it's it's a really tough spot and. Um, yeah, there's no easy answer, but it's, um, I just want to recognize that it's a common, common concern. Yeah. Yeah. And we can hope that continued conversations and how people can be supported yeah. in those, you know, uh, trying to be ambitious, trying to be forward thinking, trying to think outside the box, but also in ways that are manageable and can be monitored closely, can be readjusted if, if unintended consequences start to present themselves. Yeah. Um, but Abigail, I just wanted to say thank you so very much. It was a really rich discussion. I really appreciate everybody that was uh, participating in the chat as well. This has been excellent. And so with that, I will just take us to a couple outro slides very oh, briefly. Let me stop sharing. Sorry. That's great. Oh, and I can take it from you, I think. Oh, so, okay. You got it. You got it. Um, cool. And then let me get over to... Oh, forgive me as my, you, you all are seeing that screen. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. There we go. Oop. That is not what I wanted. Okay. So as I get down here, my computer seemed to have froze up for just a moment, but we are back. So as I get into, there we go. All right. So once again, I wanted to remind everybody about the Stewardship Network Conference happening January 29th and 30th, 2024. Um, we're so excited to have everybody be a part of that. It is one of the most magical things that we do at the Stewardship Network, an in-person manifestation of the network that we all value so much. So please visit stewardshipnetwork.org slash conference for more information and to register. And once again, meet the match. We're encouraging everybody, please, uh, you know, dig into your pockets, be as generous as you possibly can. We so, so deeply appreciate all of the support that we've gotten already and all of the support that we hope comes through in these next couple of weeks as we seek to meet the match of $250,000, which will be matched one-to-one -one by a generous donor. So we encourage you become a regular with these uh, monthly webcasts, second Wednesday of every month, the Eastern Time Zone's noon hour. So we'd like to preview a couple that we have coming up. Oh, forgive me. So uh, identifying recoverable fire dependent systems in the Huron Manistee National Forest with Jesse Lincoln of the Michigan Natural Features Inventory that is in January. We have Not So Different, Using Bugs to Fight Apathy and Inspire Empathy with Christy Reddick and Jessica Honecker, The Bug Chicks. We are particularly excited about that one. We've been looking at that, that, that on our calendar for quite some time, February 2024. Uh, and Returning the Wild to the Wilderness, Loss, Legacy, and New Opportunity with Thomas Keller of the Pennsylvania Game Commission, and that is coming up in March of 2024. 
And with that, thank you all so very much. Really appreciate you. Abigail, thank you for taking the time. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the day.